Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Nathan George. Nathan is the CEO of Void Robotics, a company that specializes in affordable robot laborers. Nathan, welcome to the pod. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. We've been talking about this for a while. Um, I appreciate you uh, you making it in. I guess maybe a good opening question would be, what does an affordable robot laborer look like? like? What does that mean in the context of what Void does? Sure, yeah. So I can talk a little bit about affordable labor. I care a lot about affordable labor. It's something that it's it's kind of what I'm trying to get more into. Um, I used to do a lot of contract work, and one of the biggest issues um, was cost. So a, a lot of times the robots would be built, but the ROI was, was pretty heavy. It would be like over five years or something like that. Um, and I, I believe, I, I hope that one of the ways to progress uh, robotics is to start by making um, affordable prototypes. So basically just using just cheap off the shelf components, make the robot cost under 10K, make the like cost like $1 an hour or something like that, and then move up when it comes to the, the quality of it. So how, did, how does that dollar a day get calculated? So what does that look like um, in terms of, is that the five-year ROI or is that, is that something different? So my approach is that um, it's not necessarily the robots I'm making are very industrial. They're, they're, they're very basic. They just use like, like um, I, as you remember, I'm using the, like the, the toolbox made out of just prefabricated uh, plastic and using we, and, and just like, you know, rubber wheels and things like that, but it's relatively stable. So I've seen other competitors, they cost, let's say 30 grand, per robot for the software. My approach was like, what if I tried to lower the cost to just $1 an hour, something to play off of like, you know, minimum wage is like eight or $9 an hour and try to make my money back that way. So that way the, um, the, the, the customer doesn't need to put an upfront payment, which can be really hard for a lot of, a lot of customers I've talked to. Um, they're, they're, they don't want to spend 30, 40 grand on a, on a, on a, like a, a one or two month demo, a tr- trialing out their place because it's they, it might fail them. They're going to run out of the money, and the one hour, one dollar an hour is cheap enough to where um, I can probably I can still make my money back, but it's not going to be too much for them too. Yeah, that's interesting. So when you say uh, robot laborers, you're referring to just a mobile robot base, then like not even necessarily um, like something with a manipulator, like you might think of when you think of a laborer. Like it could just be one of those toolboxes shuttling stuff around a factory, for instance, like Kiva style. Yeah, that'd be our initial, uh, our initial target niche is uh, uh, moving stuff outdoors, um, but eventually would move into indoor robotics as well as uh, mobile manipulators as well. But, but right now I want to, um, there's, there's, there was actually three or four customers I had that wanted this, like they wanted al- almost the same exact thing, but the, but the number of features they wanted was just a lot. So, um, that's why I ended up building that large team I talked about earlier. So. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, feature creep is real for anyone that ever does contract engineering or even has a product that they need to customize. I feel like that's, you know, uh, somebody told me a really good anecdote the other day and I'm trying to remember it for the life of me and it's, it's escaping me, but it was like something along the lines of, you know, like I want an app that will give me directions or tell me where every national park is, you know, in the United States. And like, All right. Yeah, sure. That will take about a week. It's like, okay, now make it so that, you know, it can detect when a tree is in bloom just from looking at it. I'm like, ah, that's a way harder problem. <laughs> so, yeah. so tell me about that large team, like just for people listening, what, what does that look yeah. like? Yeah, that's one of the more unique aspects about my company. I love, I love to talk about. So, so basically, uh, um, I happen to come across a relatively large following on LinkedIn. I have about 50, over 15,000 followers right now. And that was more just, Kind of for fun, I feel like it'd be useful in the future. 
What I didn't realize is that literally every week I would have three or four engineers with master's degrees wanting to work for me for free, right? Um, now, granted, I would rather pay them, and, I, and that's one of my highest goals is to is to pay them for their like a stipend for their internship. And for the longest time, I just kept sending people away because I'm just like, I just I'd rather work with you know paid engineers, um, high, you know higher skill things like that. But I love project management, and I there was this project, the the, the void walking project that a lot of customers were looking for, but they needed a ton of features that were just unrealistic or the budget that they would give me. So I thought, okay, what I decided to do is I decided to um, just take on as many as I could. So what, uh, so this year I took on about 70 interns. Each intern oh, lasted, boy. yeah, it's, it's crazy, right? Uh, 70, 70 interns, um, each one lasts about three months now. Um, and yeah, they're generally really good. They all have, um, they're all, most of them are international. They, they um, come with uh, a bachelor or master's degree um, and they work really, really consistently um, most of the time, very consistently. They learn a lot. I would say that they learn, almost everyone who works for me says they learn so much more working here than in college because it's, it's a very different environment, as you can probably guess. But the best part of it is, which is what I love about it, um, I'm getting so much quality features in because of the system. I created a bunch of internal systems to, to manage the interns make sure the quality is good, like coding conventions, PRs, um, multiple stages of review, things like that. So we're getting a ton of great features for clients and as well as our product. And I'm just going to keep doing it. And at some point, I'm going to double it. So as opposed to having 30 interns at a time, we'll have 60 and we'll just keep going. So I thought you said we'll you see. had 70 this year. OK, but those were overlapping. So you've had 30 in a, in a crop, as it were. Exactly. It was about two and a half ish uh, seat. Uh, rounds this year. I do think. you rotate them out constantly, or do you have like cohorts that where they they sort of get to know each other and then they all terminate at the same time? No, so yeah, that's, that's, so they actually can start or stop whenever they want, and that's one of the this. So another aspect about this program that I created that that I like a lot, and I'd encourage others to do it too. Although I don't necessarily want to give. <laughs> I, I like I like having it. All, um, a lot of people are just coming to me because one of the things they say often is that there's almost no other program like this that exists. But I, I don't mind saying it too because I think it's important. So basically what I do is um, I allow them to essentially come in whenever they want. Um, and it's a remote internship too. So they don't have to, because a lot of times it's hard to spend the money to travel and to live somewhere else. And um, one of the things they say often is, and they also, they also can work whenever they want, as long as they put in the 30, 40 hours, they can work at nighttime if they want to. Because we, we actually have interns all over the world, so not just in America, but like, you know, uh, India, Europe, uh, South America, awesome. even Africa a few yeah. times. So, so my, my, my strategy is give people as much freedom as possible, um, but, then, but then because they're generally newer engineers, I create re relatively strict systems on the actual technical side of like what they can push or what they can't push. And what that just allowed, what, what it so far has allowed is just, you know, a nice system that teaches a lot of people good stuff. You know, normally I would have to pay, I actually calculated it. Uh, I would have to pay about one or $2 million for this kind of labor if I had to pay for it. One so. or 2 million per annum or uh, like yeah, per, per year. Month? Yeah. Okay, cool. I yeah, think so. That makes yeah. sense. Um, I would imagine that management overhead is probably pretty high, but that's just based on experiences I've had with interns. It sounds like maybe you've got around some of those issues just by, doing it so much and creating the scale and the procedures behind it. Yeah. Um, I have so many questions. So another one I want to know is like, how do you regulate what is allowed to get pushed and what isn't uh, presumably on GitHub or something similar? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So um, although I love robotics engineering, I consider myself a bit more skilled than project management actually. So project, so project management, these systems, I have about like probably 50. I, cr I started creating them about six years ago. I actually started when I was um, starting my company. So this is back in 2017. The si so to answer the question specifically, um, it, it was very challenging in the beginning because there's just so many things that are missing. But essentially what it comes down to is it's, it's, it's relatively simple. So each engineer has a task which I create on, on ClickUp and it has estimates, things like that. They have work to do. They have their own branches on GitHub. When when they um, when they they essentially work on that branch, I tend to put 
two interns on the same task or, or something like that. Smart. And oh, that's fine. Yeah. And then what I have is um, an engineering manager review section. And I actually use interns for that too. So some of the interns are, are, are you know, they're more skilled than others. And I say, you know, it's, it's very, you know, they understand it's very important to have managerial skills because you can get paid more for that as well. And they're interested. So I train some of them to be the engineering managers. They essentially check the PR, they check coding conventions, like, you know, is the code um, formatted correctly? Is it in the right place? Usually the main thing is just is, is the, does the actual function work? And they, one of the most important parts of this system is making sure that um, there, there's a video or an image validation because um, which I have any other company so far, because a lot of times it's just a, it's just a, like a, like a, you push the code. But the problem with that is that 90% of the time there's a bug in it. So I have to like, in addition to checking the code, ask for a PR, say, okay, does the robot move as it should? Does the robot move over here? Does it you know, do this or that? And then I have a project manager section, which then I check to double check um, the, the engineering manager work, and then it gets merged. So. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's that's really awesome too, because that means you're not a bottleneck on all that stuff, and you've got the EM training um, and and checking all that stuff. Do you ever have issues with um, like an EM say slacking off and just not really checking the stuff and just allowing everything through, or being too strict and not allowing anything through to the point where nothing gets done? Yeah, that's a good question actually, because um, I face a little bit of that, but it, it luckily hasn't been too bad. When it comes to being too slack, like they just push things through, yes, but it's not necessarily because, like, I think they just don't know how to do it yet because they're so new. So what the, what what I did is I simply showed them what I would do. So I would be like, hey, you know, I make sure to write everything down. So like literally, I have like a ten step process. So you know, I, I basically say spend more time reading these little sections. You know, actually do this, actually do this, actually. And once I clarify to them that you know. Don't just push it through actually read through the system i almost never have an issue with all the project managers or i mean the engineering managers doing it now when it comes to being too strict i haven't faced that problem yet i would love that and actually i, I, I wish them to be a more strict on the on the reviews but uh that's harder to do so yeah it makes a lot of sense to me somebody yeah. Showed me like a really fun email they wrote, uh, or funny to me email they wrote like a few nights ago, where they, um, I guess they had a vendor that was underperforming, and um, they drank a whole bottle of champagne and wrote an angry email about how unacceptable the underperformance was. <laughs> and then luckily, um, their you know romantic partner was smart enough to say, "Hey, why don't you not send that? Send it to me instead of the customer or the the vendor." And if you still want to send it tomorrow, <laughs> we can we can send that out. And um, he read it to me, and I was like, "I'm really." Did you send it? And he's like, "Oh no." <laughs> it's like good. <laughs> yeah, shouldn't have sent that. But um, that's like the other side of being too strict is like you know just you know taking it personally and and getting I get there sometimes, but yeah, right, yeah. that's that's interesting. Um, no, that's that's really cool. Um, so then that sounds like a pretty interesting procedure um, and a cool training program. And it sounds like people are probably grateful for going through it. Do you ever have people like overstay the three months and, and kind of stick around longer or like jet before their time's up? Both. Yeah. Um, when it comes to people who jet early, you know, it does happen. I probably get out of the 70 or 70 this year. I probably had like five. So it does happen, you know, like, Sometimes they need a paid internship, and that's why I'm working on trying to. Uh, yeah, but that's like a seven percent that. attrition rate. Like that's pretty good. Yeah, I think I think it's pretty good. Some, you know, sometimes so a lot of people just get overwhelmed because the work's too difficult. So then I increase the difficulty of the of the initial prompt that they have to do. I actually recently increased it um, quite heavily, actually. So we'll see how that goes. Um, just because I was I was getting so many interns that I needed to like. Is that automated? I needed to somehow. What's that? Is the prompt automated or how do you? How yeah, do you... so the whole system is automated. Yeah, so I have ah. this um, ClickUp. You, you can look into it if you want, but it's called ClickUp. And um, basically, it's just an application they fill out. All the steps are automated. All the information gets sent to this little area where I can read it pretty quickly. Um, I also formulate the questions in a way where it's like, you need to have this or you know wait until you can do this. Um, so yeah, I don't. So 
in the beginning, it would take me a lot of time. Nowadays, from, from initially talking to someone to getting them onboarded, the average person takes me literally 20 minutes. That's pretty cool. So I, it used to take me like three or four hours per person just because there was like a lot of stuff I had to do. And I just got the system down in 20 minutes. And the reason it's so long is because like 10, 15 minutes is me just wanting to talk to them because yeah. I think it's important to have like a face to face. So, but yeah, most of this, most of it, I don't, I don't do I anything. Which is great. But yeah, to answer your other question, um, uh, attrition rate is pretty low nowadays, which is good. Um, I mean, I think in the beginning it was a little harder because I, I didn't really know how to pick. Now, when it comes to people who stay longer, oh, that's I'm interesting. Honestly, like, so, raising the entry requirement is what's gotten that down. Basically, yeah. yeah See, one smart. thing I noticed is that, like, so, so there were unfortunately a, a, a decent amount of liars too. Um, not, not. Yeah. When I want to say decent amount. I mean, like, I I have met about four, I think, out of like eighty, you could say maybe ninety of just people of, that just, I also, just basically forged their credentials and came in saying they could do stuff they had no business doing, basically, or. I don't, I don't, I don't want, want to say that, but what I would say is that they, they definitely lied about what they did at Void Robotics because I, I confronted them on it on LinkedIn and they just ignored me. Ah, bro. Um, yeah. And I, so part of the problem is that like, there's a lot of people who are, and 95% of them come from India. So, and I understand that, um, that a lot of them, they're desperate to stay in America and they'll do anything it takes. Um, and they they generally want to work for me, but my work is just too hard for them a lot of the time. So <laughs> some of them lie about it, and I, there's nothing I can do about it. So but yeah, except call them out on LinkedIn, does, put them on blast. <laughs> nah, I don't do that. You know, I um, but yeah. So but, but I I love talking about the overperformers because I'm not honestly highly surprised how many people want to stay with me longer than three months. Because my thought process is. Like this is unpaid. Like why would why would you stay here, right? But honestly, like th there's literally like twenty, maybe I would say twenty percent of interns stay indefinitely or just longer. That's like for example, my and it tends to be my best engineers too. That's the weird thing. Like it's almost always the ones who are performing the highest that tend to stay the longest, huh. and the ones who leave, I mean, almost every single time, the ones who like leave before they should are the ones who are doing almost no work so it's it's still weird like i love talking about this that actually is kind of nice though because it saves you having yeah. to term them <laughs> like if they're just going on yeah. their own i mean that that is it, it does help but yes yeah, so like my senior well i call them seniors but they're probably not the same seniors that, like you would work with they're they're like a different level of senior but i call them senior and, and my senior or mid-levels they're they're just really good and like for example one of them's been here for seven or eight months Another one has been here for about seven, eight months. Uh, this one guy recently got promoted. He's five months. And I think the main reason they're staying is because, well, first, is it's a, it is a hard job market. Um, I I know that three or four years ago, the interns that I worked with, they went on to, to really great things. Like they went on to Tesla. One of them went on to Tesla. Two of them went on to these really good startups. I don't remember the names of. They were super smart people, but the market was so much better back then. That, like three years ago when there was just less uh, robotic engineers. Nowadays, it's super cutthroat. There's just so many uh, people coming in. Uh, and so I think a large part of it is like, um, they, they know they need more experience. Like it's even the senior, my senior levels, they need a lot more experience to be like, let's say at my level. So I think there's because you know, they want to keep learning and they said they love the environment too, so. Yeah. Well, and I, I got to believe from what you're saying, I mean, if your highest performers are the ones sticking around the longest, like they've got to be passionate about the work too. Yeah. Cause that's, that keeps me around with a lot of stuff is just like, Oh, I love working on this problem. <laughs> like, I love the yeah. people I'm working with or it's, it's the people, the problem and the money I think are, are the main things that, that keep me motivated. And I think it's like that for a lot of people. So you don't have the money cause they're unpaid. But you've yeah, got the culture my, and you've got interesting work. And so I'd say it's, it's yeah. got to be those. Exactly. Yeah. When, I, I think um, I try. I, I really care about company culture and not having a toxic environment because I have been in a few in the past, as I, I mentioned that to you before. Sure. Um, sure. Where people would just yell at me every, every day. It's brutal. Man. And even though I was, <laughs> I was always the highest performer, too, that was a funny thing. Um, and, and yeah, so, you know, being accused of lying and things, I didn't like I didn't do that. I I'm really, I care about honesty and I, I care that all my employees yeah, are honest. Um, so 
Yeah. And so what, as you said, once I fit and the money aspect is big for a lot of people. So like once I fix that, then um, my hope is to scale it eventually to have like 100, 150 interns per um, like at one time, so, um, because there's just no joke. There's literally thousands of people, probably tens of thousands of interns or engineers in America getting their master's, bachelor's degree, but no actual opportunities in the field that they're interested in, which usually is Ross too. So that's pretty slick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really I, cool. Would you put in, so you talk about scaling to like 150 um, interns. Do you think you could do it with the existing model or would you want to bring in maybe like some people that are less likely to turn over to run it, like have like a paid layer and then. Have, oh, of course I wouldn't. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the reason I'm capping at 30 right now. So I yeah. think, 30, I think 25 or 30 is my cap right now. The reason I'm doing that primarily is because I have to be the project manager. So I actually have to, um, I have to actually train new engineering managers. Then I have to actually double check the project, um, double check what their work is. So one of my highest goals is to, is to convert one of my, um, all of my, uh, my senior levels into uh, full-time engineers. And um, then once that happens, they'll, you know, have more time and then I can start scaling to, to higher numbers. Yeah, that makes sense. And especially if you use those guys as EMs and you can, you know, bring them up as it were and promote from within. I mean, that seems like a su super awesome way to staff that, you know, in the, in the long term. So, yeah. And, and, and part of the reason I do it this way, and I, and I think you mentioned this too, as something in your business for me, uh, I'm very choosy in who I want to like, who I want to work with as I'm, you know, cause culture fit, but also just technical skill is very hard to find both in the same person. In my experience, it's like five to 10% of engineers I work with is like that. It's not to say the other 90% are bad. It's just that they're, well, you mean the other 95%, yeah. but you're, you're saying the 5% are the ones that hit the culture and the, and and the, the skill technical. level. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. And I mean, it, not everyone's going to be, you know, a smoking ace or whatever. I mean, like, that's just kind of how distribution of skill works. And I mean, culturally, I would say it's almost kind of similar where, I mean, you know, you've got your culture and you find people that kind of fit within it. Um, I don't know. I mm -hmm. think we have similar ideals, you know, like, you know, both want yeah. to be you know, honest and treat people right in business and deliver value, for instance. Um, I don't know. I try to exercise empathy a lot. So I feel like that helps me form a common ground with a greater number of people. And it seems like you do too. And so yeah, I actually added compassion, which is, you know, similar to empathy. I actually added compassion on my application because some of my applicants were just like kind of rude. <laughs> I didn't know how else to brutal. Like, how do you validate get, that I, though? I mean, I, I guess you just, that comes out in the interpersonal interview. Yeah, so a lot of it comes out in just talking to them. That's like a big part. But a lot of the engineers I work with are super quiet. That's just their nature. I don't know. Maybe it's just like a cultural thing because a lot of the work, a lot of the people I work with are Indian. So that's just. I mean, it's not like on purpose, but like, um, but they tend to just be quieter. Um, and that's it's harder to judge if they're going to be rude to people or not. My my experience is I, I tried to craft the question in a way where it's like, at least for me, it was easier to just tell, like, it's, it's hard to like, I mean, yes, you, I mean, people can lie on a question, no doubt, but I love studying philosophy. So I tried to phrase the question in a way where it's like, the, at least the most difficult to lie about. And then um, so far, that's for me. It's not perfect, but that's just. Can I ask how what your screening question is? There, uh, you obviously sure, have yeah. to say, but I'm kind of curious. So yes, I I actually have three questions. I have compassion, humility, and criticism, because I think um, compassion is important. But what I actually care more about is um, humility. So it's so it's like someone like you know, you don't think you're all that basically, yeah, yeah. and you don't you don't just like because a lot of times, yeah. A lot of times, a lot of times, engineers might think, "Oh, I'm so awesome, you know, I can just move here or that," and then they're never gonna get any work. Yeah, well, especially if you're it. chasing that, you know, like upper, you know, one percent of like intelligence quotient or whatever you're yeah. after. Yeah, 
which I'm also doing. Yeah, I'm also I want uh, to I generally want to get the top 10, at least 10%, I would say. Yeah. But I also have the yeah. criticism question because um, a lot of these a lot of these engineers are, you know, just they have a lot to learn. So I have to constantly help them. But to answer your question um, about the compassion uh, prompt, what I put is in 50 words or less, explain your strongest opinion and how you could be wrong. Oh, that's we interesting. Yeah, we want to see if you can contemplate the opposite perspective. So the reason I added this question was because I really like that. Um, yeah, yeah, because Phyllis. So in my opinion, psychologically, it's very difficult for people to talk about something in the contrapositive in something that they absolutely discussed. So, for example, um, well, my strongest opinion is you know I'm a Christian, I love God, but what I would put on this would be like, yes, God could be wrong for these reasons. And so what I and so what I do is I ask them, what's your strongest opinion? And tell me why you're wrong, basically. Yeah, yeah. And if they, if, they, if they do that, it's like, yes, you could fake that. But even if you fake that, the fact that you know how to fake that shows me that at least you understand what compassion is. And that's basically yeah. enough for me. So. And you've got the mental, uh, you know, I don't know if plasticity is the right word, but you've got the ability to conceptualize things from different points of view, even if it's not what you believe yourself, which I think is really important. Exactly. Yeah, that's the goal. Yeah, that's so. that's awesome. Yeah, that's. Yeah. I, I really think that's a clever question. Um, can I ask what the other ones are? <laughs> Just since we're already on. Yeah, sure. No, it's funny because yeah, the other ones are even more important to me. So, um, the humil the humility question is. Well, actually, this question may actually. I think the compassion question is slightly more important, but I'll just say it. With the, the humility question is, imagine you were very angry and heard. Because you've been talking for two minutes, we need you to stop talking and start listening. In 50 words or less, how would you respond? So the reason I added this question is that sometimes I get, it's, it's rare, but like maybe like 5% of the time, I'll, I'll talk to people who, for whatever reason, they just won't stop talking. Like they're, they're, they really believe in what they're saying. And these people, yeah, it, it is very difficult to work with. Um, and I'm actually getting at a deeper issue sometimes I see, which is like, you know, someone just strongly believes in something. So it's kind of similar to the compassion question. I was actually thinking about combining the questions, but for me, I have worked with very angry people in the past and I don't think it's productive for working. Like, yeah, you can, it's important to be angry, right? But wow. you shouldn't, like, is it really you shouldn't though? yell. <laughs> But yeah, if you start yelling at someone, I don't like that's just not productive. And it, it happens quite a lot back in the day, I would say. So that's why I have this question. That's to, interesting. I'm trying yeah. to think how I would answer that because I feel like I don't get angry very often. I mean, I guess if I were to, you know, just to put myself in the interviewee's shoes, you know, if somebody told me to stop talking, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. Just shut up and listen for a moment, you know, and see see what's going on. Yeah, I mean, if someone told me, like, hey, you've been talking too much, just listen. I'd be like, oh, you're right. Like, I, I was talking too long. I often talk too long. And I, I, it's, it's important for us to listen to each other. And that's, that's basically the only way that I think you can be highly intelligent. That's just, I mean, that's just, that's just me. But yeah, I mean, I um, guess not that I am. No, no, no. It's like that Socrates, like, if I know anything, it's that I know nothing quote, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And so. yeah, there's a, there's a, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that. There's, there's a nice, there's another quote that, from from Christianity, it's like if anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not know as he ought to know. And I love that quote. It's like you don't even know it; you're just imagining that you know it. <laughs> so, yeah, I love that. Uh, and the last question, um, I would say, I think this is my most important question. In fifty words or less, how do you respond to criticism such as on your ability to understand instructions or your working speed? We'll give you the tools to improve in senior levels. Um, and senior levels may criticize us. So the reason I, I have that question is because maybe this is just my style, I don't know, but I, while I don't believe in micromanaging in the sense that like I give them a task and I talk to the average intern once or twice a week, I, it wouldn't make sense for me to pay someone 80K if they're working three times harder than someone else. My My personality is, I'll just increase the pay of the guy doing good and, and fire the guy who's doing bad. But I also do not want to, I don't want to fire anyone. I don't want to remove anyone. 
so my approach is kind of like basically i'm gonna like make, i'm gonna help you grow so much be kind about it right but i'm gonna help you grow so much and either you're going to leave because it's too hard or you're going to become better and what happens most of the time is they become better like for example today i actually um i i um what's the word i increased the rank of one of my engineers to mid-level he was an entry level um he's been with me for five months he was actually my worst engineer by far like it was <laughs> like i had 30 engineers he was the worst one and the craziest thing is because of mentorship you know no joke he's actually my best full-time engineer oh that's awesome no, like no joke, within like three months that's like base and, and mentorship doesn't work on everyone like some people don't want to be mentored or it's hard but this guy specifically he's a very you know he's a very good person and stuff yeah well a lot so, of that yeah. comes down to humility as you put it too you know do you have the ability yeah. to accept criticism and and grow from it and he did he i had to criticize him a lot actually because um but he went like he went from not being able to like understand how to push a pr or or just add a simple like Ross 2 command to fixing my hardest problems that even like I don't necessarily know how to t solve like immediately like I could solve <laughs> it it would just take me a little bit of time but he 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 could so he can he knows how to at least solve those problems it takes me it, it'll take him you know long like you know but it, but he's still doing it faster than the other interns and it's just incredible so that's yeah. awesome and it feels good when you're able to boost somebody up like that. Like I know I've been fortunate to have mentors that were willing to sort of be patient mm -hmm. with uh, with me at certain points in my career where I was uh, maybe a little yeah. bit challenging. And so I, I'm grateful for that guidance and, and support, you know. And it's good that you're giving that to other people. Yeah, no, it's good. I do, even though I really care about creating a product and, and making money, I also care a lot about uh, just you know, like people are people, you know, they, they have a life and you can't, I want to be careful not to just see them as a number. Cause there's some, there's a lot of them and, and they can be confusing at times, but yeah, you want, you want to help people as much as you can. So. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the, the things that I guess, uh, I mean, it just sounds like with your culture, it comes down to c compassion, humility, not being a jerk is kind of what I'm hearing is the theme here, you know, and, and obviously yeah. being really good at what you do but you know, not fully yourself about it. So um, are there any other sort of things that are important to you um, in terms of Void's culture? Uh, well, I've talked a lot about the, like, the soft skills, so the compassion, humility, criticism. From a soft perspective, I, um, the w one more thing, that I would say my most important, um, so my most important system, I have like 50 systems, and I tell them all, this is my most important system, so please don't fail it, right? I actually don't have this as an application question because I don't I don't know how to validate it. But my most important system is actually communication. So and you, you might have seen this from the way I text you or someone else, but I care a lot about communication. I don't like people who just like, oh, you piss me off, I'm gonna block you. Like that's just being like unnecessarily weak in my opinion. Yeah, you're petty um, and, and you're never gonna work through that. I mean that's short sighted for sure. It's not like how you progress in life too just like as a person but and more, more than that i'm a, this is a completely remote internship for the thing that i was talking about and, and they, they work from completely different time zones times of the day um and more than that i just think that proper communication builds teamwork and teamwork and unity in my opinion is just so much more valuable than hard skills it's not to say I don't want the hard skills because like I, I have a pretty hard application question that like, you know, that you have to, you know, be able to do. In my in my experience, I'd rather work with lower level engineers rather than a, than higher level engineers that can't communicate, that don't actually respond to your emails, that get pissed at each other and get angry and call each other names. Because at least in my experience in robotics, Robots are so hard, as you know, right? And yeah. I mean, you, you can make it work that way too. Um, it, but I yeah, guess no I have a way to I scale a business or, or live your life. Yeah. I mean, well, it's more it's more like I just don't have patience for that. Like if some if somebody's yelling at somebody else, there's a good chance I'm going to like get quite angry 
Or if somebody is like cursing or insulting someone, I know a lot of people, a lot of bosses, they'll just be like, hey, that's just, you know, just ignore him. It's fine. Now I'm the kind of person that's like, what the heck are you doing? Like, I'll get, I'll get so mad. You? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and then it's just so then I've just taken this approach where it's like, let me just find the people who are like, you yeah. know, less likely to do that. So. I do have the luxury recently in my career of just working with a lot of super duper senior engineers where they've kind of honed those soft skills. And there's yeah. people I've considered too for work where um, they seem to have the hard skills, but I just wasn't completely confident in their ability to work well with others and, you know, integrate mm -hmm. into the team dynamic. So at SKA, I mean, the, the culture is, you know, merit above all, but then also, you know, Humility, I would say, is important. Um, I would say also informality, like having just a dark sense of humor, I think, goes with part of our culture. And then yeah. um, just honesty and openness and being willing to talk through things. You know, I think, you know, if I'm, if I'm thinking about it out loud, like those are all traits I value. Um, yeah, you know, nice. when you're yeah. wrong. <laughs> Stuff like that. But, you know, I yeah. mean... You know, it's amazing. Like, you can be working on a project, um, you know, as, as I find myself doing uh, from time to time, where, um, you know, you'll be brought in as, as you know, the, the field experts, and you still get it wrong sometimes. And, you know, as we all do, I mean, nobody's infallible. And so I think if you're honest with your customer and you tell them, hey, look, you know, like, I screwed up. This is on me. I apologize. We're, we're going to fix it, and here's how. You know, and, and you say that as soon as you know, <laughs> like assuming it, it, it requires their intervention and, and them to know about like sometimes you can you can solve problems without, you know, making them your customers problems. And sometimes that's the right thing to do because it, it keeps their management overhead of the team down. But other times you got to tell them like you're, if you're going to have a delay, like due to something that you know, has just become outside your control, the sooner you expose that, you know, if it needs to be exposed, I think the more options your customer has in being able to deal with it and, and the happier they are if they're, you know, a good culture fit, you know, like if they're, if they're able to handle that sort of bad news, which I've, I've really been trying hard. Like I've, I've turned down a lot of work um, recently, just trying to sort of focus on right fit customers as well as people to work with. So that's been kind of nice is just, having the luxury of just really awesome technologically sophisticated customers that understand the engineering process and just are, are super duper intelligent and, and just a pleasure to work with and appreciate good work. So that's, that's been another thing I've, that's kind of maybe one of my, I don't know if I'd call it a secret, but that's, um, that's one of the ways I try to run my business is just seeking out awesome customers as well as people to work with. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good skill. It, um, yeah, that, that's actually that's one of the reasons I wanted to why I didn't feel like I was cut out for for contracting and I wanted to move towards products because that's not a skill I'm r really good at is is just finding good customers that are, are technical enough to where they're not going to get, you know, they're not going to want a million dollars worth of work for 5k. And <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting back. Yeah, no, literally, literally, I, we talked about yeah, that. But for sure. But and I'm, I'm getting well, I'm getting better at that. But no, it's just like, yeah, that, that's, yeah. that's such a good skill. Well, a lot of times it's either it's customer education or it's it's just having a conversation. I guess that's customer education. It's customer education or it's it's just looking for customers that understand engineering enough to know what's realistic and what isn't and turning down customers that aren't. There's a company we're talking to now um, in, in a sales capacity where, you know, and I, I'm obviously not going to say who they are, but some of their timeline um, desires are unrealistic in my opinion. And I'm rapidly approaching, you know, I've, I've kind of raised the alarm a few times and said, Hey, I don't know that what you're asking for. I, I usually the, the word I use to be polite, as I say, it's ambitious. If somebody is just, you know, like for the amount of money they're trying to spend, they don't understand, you know, like, Hey, this isn't feasible. Um, yeah. A lot of customers are hesitant to want to release, you know, pricing because they, they think you're just going to jump on them and try to build the maximum amount. But we build time and materials. I mean, it's like, yeah. I don't know, we, it behooves me to be efficient because, you know, otherwise, you know, why would anyone want to hire me again if I'm just spinning exactly, around circles? Yeah. 
And I find if, if, you know, SKA is working with technologically sophisticated clients that understand what they're looking at, then they can recognize that efficiency and appreciate it. But then if you get a client that doesn't really have an engineering background and you're doing contract engineering for them, they don't really understand. And hopefully this doesn't alienate anybody, but they don't necessarily always understand, um, you know, what's realistic and what isn't or what they're looking at in, in a work product. So it's like that, you know, like, can you find make me an app that locates the nearest national park? Yeah, sure. Easy. You know, now, you know, can you make me an app that like tells me what kind of animal I'm looking at through my camera? Like much, much harder, you know, and so. I feel like if somebody's yeah. got the engineering background to know what they're looking at, they, they can appreciate those distinctions a little more. Where if you try to work with somebody that doesn't, or like I've had customers play dumb in the past where like there was one customer I had early on where um, me and another coworker would joke that they were stupid like a fox because they would specify things um, in a way that was very nebulous and vague. And then if something wasn't to their liking, you know, like on – you know, a delivery, they would just go off the deep end and, and, you know, demand all sorts of free stuff and, and get really, really upset, you know, and, and just go off the rails. And so, you know, they, they didn't really like, it's, it's all good until it wasn't, you know? And so I've, I've learned yeah. how to kind of recognize some of those red flags and, and steer clear of them. And you, know, you definitely, yeah. I think, yeah. Now I was going to say, I, I face that a lot for, for multiple reasons. One of them is because I'm trying to gear my company more towards affordability. So generally, a lot of customers I face, it's like they think the quality of my software is dependent on the quality of my hardware, which I don't think is really related. But um, and and so what happens? Like I remember this one customer. Um, like I I thought the project was an R and D project, so if we went a little bit longer, it would be fine. And I I was late by a few days and. He just got like super mad and and yeah that was when i first learned that i have to learn how this is this is like a long time ago this is like probably five years ago but then I, I learned that i need to learn how to manage customers as you said inform them um but it's a hard task so i'm, I'm just gonna like uh leave it to people who are better and then until then you know focus on other kind of things like I love product development, so I'm just going to focus on that. For yeah, uh, that's cool too. I mean, I, I, I love them both. So I, yeah. I had the fortune. Um, I think where I first became familiar with that concept was in graduate school um, at Carnegie Mellon. One of the professors, I think it was in the business class. Um, it might have even been John Dolan who I've had on the podcast. I don't remember. But this person said, you know, customers can handle bad news. They just can't handle it late which I really liked. Mm. Um, and I, and that, that's kind of stuck with me, you know, which is, well, that's yeah. why the moment I know, like the moment I get a text, I mean, you've seen me communicate this way with stuff that we're, you know, working on where I'll, I'll reach out immediately and say, Hey, there's this new piece of information. I just want to make sure you knew it and call me, you know, if there's any issues or, you know, like let's, let's work through this. But I, I just want to make the information available as quickly as possible because that's how I'd want to be treated. You know, and if I have, decision points that are based off of having the right knowledge as soon as possible, then it behooves me, um, you know, as not a jerk <laughs> to pass along knowledge as it becomes available that, that pertains to people I'm working with decision trees. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, with, with, com with communication being my number one, um, uh, like you could say system in my company. Yeah. I think that's great. Like immediately, you know, sending, information to, to those who need it to me is should be a given although surprisingly how often that's not the case so well you have to learn that at some point i mean i i think for me like i said it was i, I first sort of started thinking about it at that lecture in grad school but i wasn't born you know realizing that you know people got to know stuff um in order to have like a healthy relationship or you know yeah. move things forward i mean i don't know like um I don't know. I would say that that that's something I learned over time. Yeah, and and a large well, a large part of the reason I think it, that's so important that that concept is is as you I think you were saying that it's not just for this because I think a lot of people get confused on this. So in case you know people are are wondering, I think the reason it's so important is because not just because of the information that's sent because it's like sometimes people will say to me, "Oh, I just thought you it's not a big deal, so I'll tell you later." But I think what's really important is 
communicating on time is kind of like a signal that you value the other person and that it, it keeps the relationship intact. And, and, what I, and it's like, yeah, if someone is like a few days like late, it, that's not the end of the world. But if someone doesn't like ends in two weeks and just like, you, you know, you start to wonder like, what's that person thinking? Why are they doing that? You know, and ironically, vice versa, when I ask them, they feel the same way when people don't talk to them. So it's kind of weird. And, and it kind of goes back to like, if you want to build a profitable company, um, you have to have people you can rely on. So if someone just doesn't communicate, then, then it's like, how, how can you build a company with them? Even if they're just an engineer, even if they're, they're just like the lowest of the ranks, I don't know, that, that's just how I feel. But yeah. I, I also do a lot of remote work too. So I don't have the luxury. So I remember someone saying, oh, I usually do like, um, uh, some some people I work with in the past it's like oh yeah I just knock on their door I just go to their cubicle and then tell them hey you know I'm their boss yeah that's a and big move like, too though because now you're taking that person out of flow state potentially I mean and and yeah. you know that that's not really a way to be conducive to their productivity either or their mental health it, so. It, yeah so it, it, a lot of it then it starts to feel like micromanaging at that point if someone doesn't want it and and for me I don't even have that luxury I'm working with people all over the world so I I I can't if they don't communicate they're fired immediately. Like I even, I even tell them like, if basically I'll give them like three chances and I usually give them about week, a week or two or two weeks. And if I just don't hear back. Them, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be like rude about it, but it's like, if, if I sent them three messages and it's been a week or two, sure. They might have something going on, but I basically just remove them at that point. And yeah. then, but I keep the line open. So it's like, Hey, you can, you know, reach out to me on LinkedIn. If, when my mom they, died <laughs> you're like oh my god i'm so yeah, sorry it, it, it's almost it's never that actually it's yeah. it's really just almost always it's oh i'm just too stressed i can't handle the work uh, but i want, but i want to get credit for the work i want to be in america i, I you know i want to stay in america i don't want to go back to india so basically i'm just going to say nothing and, and cheat the system and i can't i can't do that so yeah that makes sense. well that's tough though i mean because you don't want to be responsible for deporting someone if you can help it i've I've had it's a few of those. Happened. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so. yeah, brutal. It does feel weird when you're responsible for somebody's, you know, like ability to to have citizenship, or you've got to terminate somebody, or you know, it's not pleasant. It gets easier, I would say, um, the more you do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's responsibility is a two way streak in any relationship, and so if somebody's not doing what they're supposed to do, you know, and and you've given them ample chances to improve it. I mean, that's, you know, it's, you know, it's not really your fault at that point. You do what you got to do. So I get that. Yeah, it's funny. It, um, just a quick story. This is one of my first interns. So when I was very new, didn't have any good systems in place. I literally gave a guy like a year. Like, I'm not joking when I say he did nothing for a year. And I gave him that year because he just constantly talked about mental health problems. And um, there was a bunch of other stuff that happened too. Like um, I, I won't mention his name, but his father died, I think. And he had just a lot of mental health issues, depression. And I felt so bad. So I, I talked to him a lot about like how I think you should cope with those issues. In my opinion, spirituality is fairly cool. Yeah. But it's nice. Um, of you. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's like, what do you want me to do? I can't, I can't just keep, spending my time on you if it's been and i just kept, and then i kept like okay year like month after month after month i'm just like i want to be nice and at some point i i fired him he got deported i don't know how that worked exactly and yeah i don't even i don't and then i think he actually blocked me because I, I don't i don't have access to him but but my thought process is how much nicer could i possibly be you know i even said you're my friend i want to help you but like I, there's nothing you know at some point like what do i like what do you want me to do i can't just allow you to to stay here if you're not going to do anything yeah well it's it's kind of interesting too like I, I feel like sometimes you risk your own you know you've only got so many hours on this planet and yeah you, know, you can you can't save everybody all the time and so you know and yeah especially if he's bringing down your company and pulling you away from other work somebody said something to me recently that i kind of liked which is um every time you say yes to somebody you're saying no to somebody else which i thought was interesting mm -hmm. um yeah you know, so that kind of stuck with me. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, yeah, I, don't know. I, I get that way sometimes with, like, not wanting to say no to, to prospective clients that seem like they've got a cool project, but, you know, they might not be sales qualified. And 
you know, just yeah, actually, that's such a hard lesson for me. But recently, I cut out like ha like half the the work in my life. Um, so, like, so one one of them was the contract and stuff, you know. Not, yeah, and um, but and but there was a bunch of other like per just personal stuff I've been doing around the house or um, for other groups of individuals. I cut out because I I saw this. Um, really cool uh, YouTube video. I don't know if you know him. His name is uh, Alex Hormozzi. I don't think I know that guy. Okay, yeah. Sorry, Alex Hormozzi. Uh, yeah, I mean, not everyone likes him, but I, I think cool. I, I I think he's he's very, he's actually I think he's highly intelligent. One of, one of the smartest. He um, but um, he just had this talk on focus, and I realized, yeah, I'm not focused at all. So um, that's why you know now I am doing. I think three things you know and we, we were talking about that recently so um and and i'm trying so hard not to add anything new because uh focus is one thing i'm bad at so yeah it makes a lot of sense i mean you've got to be selective yeah, yeah. With, with your time um i mean i think i don't know your idea of promoting people up and giving them responsibility is a great way to do that too i mean and sort of multiplies yeah. the effectiveness of your hours we don't even have exactly. interns anymore because I just, for the the speed that SKA comes in on these projects at, like I, I, I found the management overhead and the and the and the miss rate was too high, to be acceptable yeah. to our customers. So I just I pretty much exclusively work with like senior and, and near senior yeah. engineers at this point. And I also think for your business model that makes perfect sense. Like it's a completely different. Yeah, too shy. <laughs> yeah. So I think it, yeah, you're I think hiring the A team. I mean, basically. Exactly. Yeah, you're hiring like basically the. I mean, that's why you get such good deals and stuff. So you know, I think, um, that's one of the that's one of the reasons I don't get as many good deals. But um, that's why I'm also moving away from contracting and towards products because the hope is that I could create a product big enough to where people want. But, but we'll see. Product so. seems fun. Um, I don't necessarily want to be on record for saying what my product aspirations presently are, but rest assured there are some. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it actually kind of does seem like a good journey. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm qualified to do it because I've been helping other people build their products for like the last eight years. And so, yeah, you know, I've seen a yeah, lot I, of what works and what doesn't work. And it's not always easy to be objective when it's your product, but at the same time, you know, if you've if you've at least hurled that boulder up a hill, you know, if I don't know, like 50, 70, 100 times, I mean, you get better and better at it and you know, you, you work out those muscles a lot. That's part of why I do yeah, contract I, engineering is I just want to be yeah. really really good at at engineering and, you know, engineering team leadership and mm. management and, you know, product development I, I'm really passionate about it and I um, I like getting in the getting in the reps that's no, that's good. I, I think I think it's really good yeah I, I I think if you created a product it'd be it'd be really good I was even telling some other people that too because I think there's a lot of people it's more like me and it's like I'm I, I'm not necessarily very confident in my abilities to make a product go to market and all that my, my approach is more like I'm on my like eighth pivot pivot <laughs> literally you know like i got pivot all the time because i don't really know what i'm doing yet and none of us know um, what we're but, doing yet <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. i mean i feel like i'm starting to focus in which is nice and i'm trying really hard to do that and i'm trying to basically learn learn along the way but yeah if you have those reps in and you have like work for that you know um creating that product is 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 you know much much easier so yeah you know. I, I hope so i i one one thing that I try to focus a lot of my time on, and which it's um, might might be uh, interesting to the viewers, is that I would say, in addition to like project management and robotics and products, one of the things I focus a lot on in the robotics uh, in in my job or in the robotics industry, I focus a lot on failed startups. Like I, I do a lot of research on them, basically. Oh, that's interesting. So you just try to understand like the failure modes and effects analysis, or I guess that exactly, wouldn't be it. It would be yeah. the root cause analysis of the failure. Like you'd want to get into like what went wrong and why didn't it go. Yeah, exactly. Like more from a business perspective. And I've, you know, for a while I thought it was like 
runway or co- or cost or I mean, it can even the cost of the rope or the cost of the robot. Yeah, no, it all, all that it plays a role. I mean, that's not the only thing people buy on. Like a lot of uh, people buy on quality, right? Not on cost. Or I mean, you know, they're buying on cost still, but. You know, I guess you buy a Lexus instead of an Audi because you want a lower cost luxury car, um, or like yeah. you just like you know Toyota reliability. Uh, but and, and yeah, and th- those things are really important. That's why I love affordable robotics, and that's what I'm trying to specialize in because I, I think it has the potential to scale. Um, but the, but I, I what I believe like because a lot of robotic startups fail like a lot, and my experience is that it comes down to demand. Or at least that's what I've seen. There's a lot of, you know, companies that are building really cool robots. Like they're highly industrial, highly, you know, they latest and greatest and Ross and things like that. But the robot might be too generic, or even if it is specific, the demand is so low. And so what happens is that they just keep getting round after round until they eventually they get sold, but they get sold at, at such a net loss. So for example, um well yeah i mean so i don't know if it's bad to use names or not specifically but uh yeah i'm Locus thinking of a few i don't want to say <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, was, I was gonna talk about it's up to you I, I i don't really have i mean i don't know probably probably better not to single out companies that we can help it okay, but sure. i mean are they are they still alive or are they dead at this point well, well got uh bought out by another company like uh, a couple, like I think, like a month ago. Oh, they, I didn't they got even bought see out. that news yet. I feel like an idiot now. <laughs> yeah, they'll no, date this to... episode too. They'll show people how long our backlog are because this is going to release in like two months. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, but yeah, look, this was like this was like the the one of the most famous companies when I was in my bachelor, uh, getting a junior ba- bachelor, yeah. like in that day. And I actually, I think I even talked to their CEO or CTO, but I was like oh, much cool. younger at that point, so I didn't appreciate it yet um and yeah and they got sold for like i think 16 million in oh, wow. their funding it's like very low much much higher yeah and and so my and that's the funny thing is is that you would think that warehousing robotics has high demands right and, and, and in my opinion it's nothing because a lot of people will say oh there's so much competition it's saturated i personally don't believe that's true just because that um According to my calculation, about 0.5% of jobs in the world are automated by robots. So in, in my opinion, the demand issue, a lot of the times, comes down to... Do you count like a dishwasher in your calculation? Sorry, I didn't mean to... I shouldn't. Well, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's, very, it's, it's, very, it's very crude, but it's like... I think what I... I don't remember the actual like way I calculated, to be honest. That's nah, all good. I didn't mean to dig in. Yeah, no, it's it, it was like... I, I remember checking like robots in the globally per year and then number of jobs exist in then just that's basically how I did it. But Oh cool. Okay, yeah. Personally I actually do include dishwashers, so Nice. Yeah, it's a robot uh, for sure. I yeah, I think I think it's a robot, but I actually tell people that when they get mad at me on LinkedIn because I have all these trolls because I have a lot of people that, <laughs> that you know fo- that follow me. And, and but then so that random people come in and it's like, You're killing like and it's not even me. I'm just like oh, you're killing the world. You're, They're you're, referring you're to you as a you're... roboticist. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just like, well, yeah. do you have a dishwasher? Because that's a robot. Technically, <laughs> nice. it's a robot. I love that but... you actually engage with trolls. Like I, I am, I am such a a weak person in that way. I'll just, I'll just remove someone on LinkedIn completely because I like don't want drama. Well, <laughs> so... well. Yeah, it's not just that too. I, I think that's I, fine. I don't do that in real I, life. Like I, I try to talk yeah. things through with people I've I've gotten to yeah. know. Like if you and I had an issue, we would discuss it. But yeah. if it's somebody I've only ever just known from a comment on LinkedIn, I'm like, I don't need this person on my LinkedIn. <laughs> like this is Yeah, it's um, it's interesting, but like for this problem, I thought about it for a long time because I think to be a large influencer you have to manage it well. What I do is if someone's actively being hateful. I just report and block them immediately. Like they're actively insulting something like that. But if someone is like kind of more like a troll and they're just like, "Hey, I don't like that." Trolls can be hilarious. I'll... <laughs> well, I'm not. I don't like being sarcastic on LinkedIn because they can come across as weird. That's, that's just my. I'm not saying it's wrong for other people. Yeah. That's just not that's just how I do it. So what I do is I'm just like, I just I just throw so much logic at them that they look stupid. Like for example, this this one this one guy. 
um, he, it was like, I, I just can't, it, it really bothers me how some people are. Cause like literally I posted this video about this, this robot cleaning a toilet or something. I watched and, that video, and, that was a good then, one. Yeah, I thought it was too. And, and then and then he commented like, um, this robot is useless because it didn't even clean the robot, right? It didn't even clean, sorry, it didn't even clean the toilet, right? And then- Oh, I think I, I remember I that went, comment. <laughs> yeah, I went back and forth a little bit because I didn't, I was just answering it a different way. And I went back and I checked the video just to double check. And then I'm just, and then, I, then I commented like, like, did you even watch the first two seconds of the video? Right? So, and I think, and then he basically liked that comment surprisingly because he, because a person knows when he's being a jerk, right? Like, yeah, yeah, for sure. It, it takes a while. So, um, that's pretty funny. But yeah, it, <laughs> it's slightly, it's a slightly different topic, but yeah. manage, managing, I didn't realize this going into it, but managing like, being an influencer or having like a large number of followers, it's hard because if you don't comment at all, the algorithm uh, detracts your posts. You actually have to comment. But then, if but another thing I, I used to do, right? Is I used to do this. I used to comment on every single hater. But what, what would happen is that if in this is like a different topic, sort of. But if you comment on every uh, single hateful post, or like hateful comment, or just an illogical comment, like someone would be like. You know this robot like I, this this one person was saying this robot was like um well i'm, I'm saying positively about them so car carbon robotics they were saying that that's an evil company because they're causing co2 emissions and i'm just like you realize there's more co2 emissions that come from the tractor that that has to like manually get the um weeds out and they're using they're using lasers and it's actually less co2 if you do the math and then nice. he was just like he, he basically just said like no, you're wrong. And, and <laughs> yeah, and, and no, it's, it's more like no, you're wrong and you're stupid. So, and, so I realized that if you if you play too much into the to the the more hateful kind of people, it actually brings their friends. I've noticed that. Like if you play into them, it'll actually bring their friends who tend to be more hateful. Oh, that's and interesting. It's this it's, it's this weird balance where like then like it, it, it's so crazy how it's night and day, black and white. Where if I if I play into that. 80% of my comments are hateful and if I don't play into that 80% of my comments are, po are positive and like and logical and intelligent right so I um it's it's, it's like a fine line though because if you if I if I just like stop commenting on all of them then it just, it, it just goes away and then I yeah just, well I mean uh, it's so tempting though to like want to engage someone in, on LinkedIn like there's a lot of things I want to post where I see something dumb and I want to troll and you know I, I think <laughs> You know, like, wouldn't it be funny to type something that points out the fallacy in this post completely? And then I'm like, why? Why, why do I need to do that? Like, why is that important to me? And like, sometimes if it, if, I, if I'm really like, like I, I just gotta gotta push it out, I'll text it to a friend. <laughs> <You know? laughs> or like one time, I think I, I I put something up and then I called a friend and told them about it, and they were like, "Do you really think you should leave that up?" And I was like, "No, absolutely not." And then I took it down. <laughs> so. It's yeah, tempting, and then also, but what, yeah. what I like about LinkedIn as opposed to mm -hmm. Facebook or I'm not really on any of them anymore. I deleted my Facebook account about five years ago, but mm -hmm. what I like about LinkedIn as opposed to Facebook when I was on there is it seemed like Facebook was a lot more political and, you know, I guess driven by differences where I feel like LinkedIn, you know, I like to think in my idealism that, you know, it's people bonding over the common ground of business. And so, you know. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, I, I still have Facebook and I have Twitter or X. Um, but yeah, it's very negative and in conflict and, and toxic a lot of the times. And, and every comment is, I hate you because you're yeah, different. But if you act the fool in front of your coworkers, you're going to get fired. <laughs> so it's like LinkedIn almost yeah. keeps you in check by virtue of the audience. <laughs> it, exactly. Like, yeah. if you post something stupid, all of your all of your friends and family will see if, if they go on it. And... I, I love LinkedIn personally because it's one of the few, and not that it's the only one, but it's one of the few social medias that handles that relatively well. So yeah, it, you know, it. I, I mean, I like Facebook and X too. I agree. I mean, Reed Hoffman, tweet. take my money. You know. It's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Musk is Musk is doing interesting stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, LinkedIn. I don't know. I I, I definitely it's the only social I'm on uh, anymore, but. 
and I, I, I do enjoy it. I, I think of it mainly as a marketing tool, but like I don't have nearly your following, right? Like I've got maybe like two and a half thousand followers, like maybe three. Yeah. You've got like 15. It, so I, I think in order to get that high, you do have to engage with a broader audience, which requires, like you said, kind of just willingness yeah. to engage with a broader audience, which... Yeah, you have to, you have to yeah. like... I mean, I think you already have a, a, a good thick skin, so it's not... But what I'm saying is like a person who is an influencer... I didn't know this going into it because I was relatively soft back then. Uh, it's not that I was soft, but it was just like I didn't realize just how random people can just hate me personally. Yeah, and I had to learn, had to learn that like wow, like I, I have to develop this thick skin. It's like what? there are some people who are just not very good people, and then most people are like ninety nine percent of people, ninety nine point nine percent of people are really really cool and awesome and. They provide a lot of value. Well, that's if so, you surround yourself with awesome people. I mean, you know, it's, that's true. That's true. it's all your perspective. I mean, if you're a negative person and you surround yourself with negativity, it probably looks the other way around. But I don't know. I try not to do that. No, it's, that's true, too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Cool. Well, it's, that seems like a good note to end on. And conf- to just, you know, being, being blunt, I, I got to run to dinner in like five minutes. But. This was fun. We should definitely do this again. Um, I always feel like the tail end of the conversation is the most interesting. And so it is. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah it's okay. where, that's where you guys like you open up and, and you really get to the meat. Um, so I, next time we do this, I'll, I'll try not to set anything after and, and we can be a little more unbounded. That'll be good. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, if we're, if we're, we're off the air now, then uh, no, I'll cut it now. Uh, before I cut it, oh, hold on, let's take a beat. So hmm. before I cut it, is there anything you want to plug? Uh, nothing too crazy right now. I mean, if, if people want to go to my website, they can go to voidrobotics.com. Um, the main thing is I'm trying to sell, uh, you know, uh, just a very affordable, cheap robot, but for industrial use cases, um, that, you know, smaller mid businesses. So yeah. Sweet. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, if you're listening check out voidrobotics.com and, uh, SKA's ad, uh, will come in a pre-recording after I shut my mouth. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SK Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SK Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.